Welcome to our joint New Year service from Kenmure and Kermile. And may I wish you all a very healthy and prosperous New Year. We begin our worship today by reading from Matthew's Gospel, where we read, When the wise men saw the star, they were overjoyed. And coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They then opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. Let us unite our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, with Mary and the wise men, we bow before the manger and worship the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid upon straw. For this is your beloved Son, the fullness of God come into this world, the Creator born as a vulnerable baby, in need of his mother's milk. Father, you delight in such meekness, and we are drawn to worship your beloved Son. Yet, Father, Christ's ministry was just beginning. His meekness was despised, his glory went unrecognised. We live in arrogance. We live to satisfy our desires. We do not acknowledge our need of your mercy. We know Christ's word to love our neighbour as ourselves, but live otherwise. Father, as Christ began his ministry of healing and teaching, he was despised and rejected by men. Yet in his meekness, in his delight in fulfilling your will, he did not falter. He journeyed from Bethlehem's manger to Calvary's cross to die as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Father, at the manger we sing, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. At Calvary we sing, Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah! What a saviour! And Father, in the light of his cross, we can place no confidence in our own wisdom, our courage, our resolve. We can but trust in the Spirit who raised Christ Jesus from the grave to complete the work he has begun in us. And so, Father, we cry out, all praise and glory and honour be to your name, O God Most High. Now, in your mercy, receive us as we pray with the Lord Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our reading this morning is taken from the letter to the Ephesians, and we'll be reading at chapter 3 from verses 14 to 21. Ephesians chapter 3, 14 to 21. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his own most holy word. was 60, one of our friends, who's a very accomplished artist, gave me one of her pictures and, and I chose a picture of a farm road. And I chose this picture not only because it's beautiful, but as a reminder that we never know what lies behind 
around the next corner. And as we stand on the, the threshold of a new year, we don't know what this new year it holds for us. And so I'd like us to consider together the wonder of God's love towards us in Christ Jesus, his Son. To consider Paul's prayer that we would know the length and the breadth, the height and the depth of his love towards us in Christ Jesus. Now, in the art gallery in the Kelvin Grove, hanging on a pillar is the most exquisite picture by L.S. Lowry. It's tiny, just a few inches square. There are no matchstick, matchstick men, no matchstick cats and dogs. In fact, in this picture, there are no figures at all. It's called seascape, and it is the sun reflected on the waves of the sea. But this picture is the essence of beauty. Once you see it, you will remember it forever. And such beauty is unrelated to size. It, it cannot be measured. It cannot be quantified in any way. It must simply be enjoyed. And when Paul prays for us to comprehend the breadth, length, height and depth of God's love, I don't think he's asking us to, to attempt the measurement of divine love. For God cannot be measured. God does not belong to the created order. He's not made of protons, neutrons and electrons. He, he does not live in space. Space and time are dimensions he has created for his people, for us to live in. God cannot be weighed. He cannot be measured. No, I what Paul is praying for us is that we would see the depth of beauty there is in his love. And, and such beauty is unrelated to size. Indeed, sometimes the smaller, the simpler something is, like Lowry's seascape, the more intense, the more exquisite the beauty. Now, Wendell Berry is hardly known in this country but he is one of America's most celebrated authors. He taught in the University of Kentucky, but found he couldn't think straight in the university, so he bought a farm. And for many years, he's done all his creative, philosophical work, whilst ploughing, sowing, and taking care of his sheep. Now, Wendell Berry is a Christian, and his most celebrated book is called Jaber Crow. And Jaber Grow stands shoulder to shoulder with Dostoevsky's Idiot as one of the great celebrations of the Christian life. Now, Jaber Crow is the barber in a town so insignificant, no one wants to be the minister there. And one day when he's in his early 20s, Jaber Crow looks out of the window of his barber shop and he sees a beautiful girl walk by laughing, joking, carrying on with her friends. And he instantly falls head over heels in love with her. Yet she barely knows he exists. She leaves school. She marries a guy who dreams great dreams, but is in reality a failure. And he squanders everything they have. Her children leave home. Her husband dies, and she never has a thought of Jaber Crow. Yet through all these years, he loves her and has eyes for no one else. Then one day, Jaber Crow learns that the love of his life is in hospital. She's dying, and she's dying alone. No one in the town cares. But Jaber Go Crow goes to her side and very gently and tenderly nurses her through her final hours. And he holds her hand as she slips from this world. And then he closes her eyelids and kisses her on the brow. And in that kiss, there is a lifetime of pure, faithful, tender love. A love this girl never knew in her lifetime. 
Uh, and Jeeper Crow is one of the very, very great love stories. He loves someone faithfully and tenderly who barely knows he exists. But his love was utterly true. He, he was there when no one else was there for this girl. He sought no reward. He simply gave her all that he had. Now, such love cannot be measured, but it is real and it is a depth of beauty that simply creates awe in one's soul. Now, two thieves were crucified alongside Jesus. To them, Jesus was just a name, a nobody, another fool of a preacher with delusions of being the Messiah, someone to laugh at over a jug of wine in the tavern. But one of these men, cursing and swearing as they crucified him, hears Jesus pray for the soldiers who nailed him to the cross. In the light of Jesus' goodness, this man comes under conviction. He acknowledges his guilt and turns and asks Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. And what happens next is beyond beautiful. Jesus does not rebuke the man for his wasted, debauched life. This man has nothing to give. Jesus asks nothing of him. But Jesus gives him all he has. He doesn't simply forgive this man. He doesn't simply say, your sin is forgiven, die in peace. No. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. He gives himself to the man. Now, this story is very familiar to us, but let's just pause for a moment to consider how great this promise is, what God in his grace must do to fulfil Jesus' promise. This man would be with him in paradise. This man is a self-confessed murderer who has acknowledged he deserves to die. God has to justly remove this man's guilt. But that's just the beginning. He must then raise this man from the grave. He must enable this man to live in the presence of his son. He must therefore glorify him and renew him in mind and heart. He must equip him to reign alongside the Lord Jesus Christ. He must liberate this man from all the constraints of creatureliness to enable him to share in Christ's very being. You see, in this wonderful promise, you will be with me in paradise, Jesus is not simply showing compassion. He is giving the man himself. He is giving him all that he has and all that he is. Now, we often quote John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him may not perish and have ever ever everlasting life. And may God in his mercy forgive us. We think of simply swapping mortality for immortality. But it is so much more than that. Death is not simply this body ceasing to breathe and beginning to decay. Death is separation from God and light and all that is good and meaningful. Eternal life is not simply living forever. It is sharing in God's very being. That God should show such love to, to one man, to this dying thief, would be a source of the most wondrous praise and adoration of his name. But he promises this to all who call upon his son. Now, there is great beauty in Jaber Crow's love for this girl he doesn't know he, who doesn't know he exists. 
just as, as there's mercy in the thief who didn't know Jesus. But, but where Jaber Crow's love reaches its zenith, at that point, Christ's love is just beginning. Jaber Crow's love is human love at its finest. But Christ's love does not merely equal the greatest human love. Jesus' love for the dying thief goes far beyond any human love. It cannot be measured, it cannot be quantified. It is a beauty beyond anything known in this world. But it's real. And though one can probe the mystery of this love, ultimately, all one can do is surrender to it, rest in it, and be lost in wonder, in love, and in praise. But let us now move from Calvary to the upper room and to another very familiar story, the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Now, fascinatingly, John introduces his account of Jesus washing his disciples' feet with the verse, knowing that he had come from the Father and was going to the Father, Jesus put a towel round his waist. Do you see what's happening here? Judas is about to betray Jesus. The religious leaders in the temple are hatching their plans to have Jesus executed. All the powers of darkness and evil are gathering around Christ. But he is not living, thinking or reacting to the schemes of men. He lives knowing the sovereignty and the goodness of his heavenly Father. So in harmony with his Father's will, his Father's goodness and his Father's wisdom, he bows before his disciples and washes their feet. This is an act of the most beautiful meekness, tenderness, gentleness and loving pastoral care. And this is not a one-off act. It is how Jesus is. And, and it is integral to his saving work. Now, th this is deep and difficult to understand. And so, so, so to, to, to come to terms with it, we must approach it from an oblique angle. Imagine for a moment that you're a worshipper in first century Jerusalem and you're making your way to the temple to pray. And you take with you a lamb. Now, when you arrive at the temple, the priest will take the lamb and slaughter it. In giving the lamb, you're acknowledging the wrong you have done. That the wrong you have done has brought death to your own soul and death into the lives of those you've touched. As the lamb is slaughtered, you pray. You pray prayers of penitence, expressing your sorrow over past wrong, seeking Yahweh's mercy, seeking new life. Now, the sacrifice of the lamb without the prayers would have just been mere religious ritual. The prayers without the offering of the lamb would have glossed over the seriousness of the guilt incurred. But together, together, the sacrifice of the lamb and the prayers of penitence express true faith. And then a second lamb would be sacrificed, a lamb provided by the priest. And the blood of the second lamb brings forgiveness. You see, our prayers, our sacrifice, can never atone for the wrong we have done. God in his grace must provide the lamb of atonement. Now, such worship was very, very solemn. But do you see how the marriage of sacrifice and prayers is essential to true worship. Now Jesus is the second lamb 
the Lamb who brings forgiveness through his death. But his death upon the cross would have been worthless apart from his beautiful prayers. His prayer in Gethsemane, not my will, but your will be done. At Calvary, his prayers for his, his, his tormentors, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And as he enters desolation, his, his, his trust in his Father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as he emerges from the desolation, it is finished. And again, trust in his Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But wonderfully interwoven with his prayers and the offering of his life, it's this beautiful, beautiful love for his disciples that expresses itself in the washing of their feet. His love weaves his prayers and his self-offering together to make this one, <coughs> excuse me, one, one complete act of atoning worship. You know, I, I think we're over familiar with Paul's words. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. But you see, Jesus washing his disciples' feet is part of his suffering at Calvary. It's part of his love for his people. Now, we must not make the mistake of thinking that we are saved by Jesus' love and that somehow we didn't need to die. Just as we, we must never think of his saving death, divorced from his love. That's like asking for what's more important, inhaling or exhaling. And it's inhaling and exhaling together that, that sustain life. And so it is with Christ. His love, his death, his prayers are what redeem and save us. And neither may, must we make the mistake that here Jesus was obeying some higher principle of love. You see, th th there is no higher authority than Jesus. Jesus defines what love is. Love is beautiful because it flows from him. You see, a number of years ago, I was very, very ill. I was in intensive care for a number of days. And the nurses were marvellous. They cared for me superbly. They were doing the job they had been trained for. They cared for me to the highest professional standards. It was the job they were paid to do. When I got home from hospital, I could do nothing for myself. My wife had to run the bath for me. She had to wash me, dress me, get me back into bed and feed me. She wasn't trained for this work. She wasn't paid for it. She wasn't working to some professional standard. She was not doing her duty. She was being herself. She is love. And when Jesus put the towel round his waist, got down on his hands and knees and washed his disciples' feet, he was not being their teacher, not being a prophet, not being a priest. He was not doing his job. He was not fulfilling some higher principle. He was being himself. He was and he is love. To meet the Lord Jesus Christ is to meet love in its fullness. Now as we close, let's put these two pictures together. Jesus promising the thief paradise and then his washing of his disciples' feet and as we begin to understand what these great events mean, we encounter a love that is of a different order to anything known in this world. We cannot begin to measure this love. 
we can simply be awed at his beauty. And as he opens his arms to receive us, though we may never have given him a second thought before, we must place ourselves in his tender, loving care. Amen. And may this great and wonderful God be with you all through this new year. Let us unite our hearts in prayer, shall we pray. Our gracious God and Father, as we think about the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot begin to understand his love. It is beyond our comprehension. But Father, we see its beauty. We understand his grace and our need and we place ourselves in his arms. In his name we pray. Amen. If you